All right, so um, now seller financing. If you talk about structuring deals, this is deal maker, right? <laughs> Why not get direct with a motivated seller without having a realtor, without having a broker, meeting in their kitchen or their living room or the back porch, my favorite places to buy deals, by the way, and figure out what the seller needs and how you can solve their problems. We talked about taxes this morning. Capital gains is a big problem. And structure a deal so they can not only sell you the property, but be your bank as well. Would you guys be interested in how to structure that deal? This is the essence and the foundation of creative real estate. And you're gonna learn so much because this guy is the ultimate relationship builder, rapport builder, and deal structure. On your feet, and a round of applause for Mr. Leon Johnson. Thank you. <laughs> Jeffrey Taylor is a hard one to follow, guys. Look, I, I got tired just sitting back there watching him. <laughs> but it was great. I enjoyed that. And all the speakers have just been fantastic. And Jim... I want to thank you so much for inviting me up here. And I've wanted to come for years. The first time I get to come here, I am speaking. So um, uh, anytime you want me, and probably September, whether you want me or not. <laughs> but uh, there's been, uh, thank you. There's, um, there's been so many great speakers. Everybody was fantastic. Everybody has their system and and that's the thing about it, you really have to get some systems. And, um, you know, back in 1975, I got my real estate broker's license. And I was still in the military. And when I got out, I moved to Lee Summit, Missouri, and started managing a real estate office. It had about 55 salespeople. And for two years, I didn't have lunch, a hot lunch at home, or a hot meal at home. And, man, it was just wearing me out. And I was lucky enough and blessed enough that I got uh, referred to go to a little seminar called Making It Big on Little Deals down at the Plaza, Kansas City, Jack Miller and John Schaub. Changed my whole life. I don't know if any of you are in this room for the first time at a seminar like this. Um, look, you're at the right place because it can truly, truly change your whole life, it change your whole direction. And um, I'm grateful for a couple of the speakers, uh, Mary Hart, I don't think Mary's in the room, but um, she gave her presentation from her heart, no pun intended. You know, and there, look, making money is really easier than you think it is, that's probably the easiest part, but to uh, stay true to your faith and, and build the right kind of legacy. You know, uh, you've got to do what's right, even when it hurts. You, you've got to care enough about people, and you always got to do what hurts. If it costs you money, if it hurts, or whatever, your, your reputation is probably the greatest legacy that you can leave behind. And I, it breaks my heart to see some folks that, you know, you want to help them and they look like good people and they, they are short-term thinkers. You got to be a long-term thinker in this deal and then life all together. And of course, I'd never heard uh, David Phelps speak until today. We just met briefly a couple of times, but it was back like, I, like he had a hammer and hitting the nail every time as far as I was concerned. And that was a great, great presentation. So anyway, I wanted to kind of give them a little bit of a tribute there. Um, freedom and peace. <clears throat> I didn't make that slide up after I got here, folks. I've had that for a long time. And uh, David pretty much spent a whole hour on freedom and peace. So I'm not going to beat that dead horse. Uh, and, you know, we look at the world today and we, we see what's going on and, um, you know, it looks like some of our freedoms, even in this country, is being eroded and there's not a lot of peace around. 
But I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about your personal freedom and your personal peace. And I want that theme to run through my whole presentation because it's got a little twist to it, and I want you to follow that twist. You know, um, Michael Jake had a slide up. <clears throat> I think everybody's real. I think most of my presentation's been given already because <laughs> there's little pieces and snippets of it from every, every person, which is fine. That's all right. Um, experience and repetition is the key to greatness, in my opinion. But um, uh, the freedom and, and peace that I'm talking about <clears throat> is your personal freedom and peace. And that slide that Michael had up there uh, yesterday uh, was uh, Zig Ziglar's statement that you can get anything you want in life if you'll help other people get, get what they want. And, at, and if you look at people's goals, you know, they want a new car, they want a new this, they want to have a thousand houses, they want this, they want that. I want to be a dentist, I want to be a doctor. And really and truly, when you boil it down and drill down, what everybody wants in their life is freedom and peace. Okay? And so, not only can you work to get your own freedom and peace, but if you will concentrate on helping others get they, what they want, and they might not even know that this is what they want, but if you can help them get freedom and peace, you can have anything you want in your life. And the other thing is, you have to be careful what your goals are. Because if you work hard enough at it, you can probably attain it. Sometimes not, but most time, if you focus and, and work at it, then you can reach your goals. So you have to be careful about that goal. You might end up with 3,000 houses, but no freedom and no peace. Does that make sense? Um, all the corpses on Mount Everest were once very energetic and ambitious people. You know what I mean? So your, your goals can take you somewhere. It can take you somewhere you want to be or it can take you to losing your family. And, you know, uh, what, does, what does it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your family? So just keep that in mind as we go through this. And I'm going to get off the philosophical stuff, but I want you to keep freedom and peace in mind. And we're going to talk about how you can help some other people get freedom and peace. Now, <clears throat> he asked me to talk, Jim asked me to talk about owner financing, and we're going to talk about owner financing and beyond. And the first, we're going to break this down in two or three areas. Number one, the mindset that you have to have to get owner financing. You have to have a mind. Let me ask, who in here, and please be honest and don't be shy, have never bought a piece of property getting owner finance? How many? Oh, man, there's a bunch of you. That's good. I'm glad you're here. I was so worried because there's so many smart, uh, experienced people in this room that I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm not going to be telling, I'm not going to be helping anybody. They're going to know all this stuff. But... It's truly a mindset that you have to develop first. And we're going to talk about mindset. And then I'm going to talk to you about what to look for that is that opportunity to get owner financing, seller financing. And then we're going to talk about how to talk to them and what to say, some of the things to say, some of the questions to ask. And then we're going to talk about... Um, how to memorialize that, what, what are you going to put in the contract, and, and what do you want in your notes and deeds of trust, and that sort of thing to make it a good deal. And then I'll, I'll hopefully I'll have time to talk to you about a couple of deals that we've done through the years that will be good examples on this. But the last part I'm going to talk about is getting a second bite out of the apple, and the example I'm given is one I got a second, a third and a fourth bite out of the apple in about a two-month period of time, okay? 
So it was kind of a unique deal. That's not going to happen like that on everyone, but it just gave you some of the possibilities of what it, what it looks like. All right, so owner financing can be a great benefit to buyers, sellers, rehabbers, uh, fix and flippers. You can use owner finance in all of those deals, okay? And um, down at the bottom there of your screen, it said, learn the benefits to everyone in the transaction. If, and, and by the way, this whole presentation is going to be geared toward you buying something on owner finance, okay? And we have bought commercial properties, mobile home parks, uh, houses, land, about anything you can think about, we've bought with owner financing. And it's been an awesome thing all the way through. Now, if you're a corporate kind of person and not from Mississippi, well, let me say this. As, as a buyer, do you think it's important to know the benefits of owner financing to the seller? Very much so, right? Don't, when we go through this, don't be thinking about just the benefits to you. Think about the benefits to that seller. In Mississippi, um, we have the saying, if you want to sell what Jimmy Jones buys, you got to see the world through Jimmy Jones' eyes. Okay? If you're a great Poupon corporate thinker, you might say you got to have client concentric thinking. Okay? That's two ways of saying it. But yeah, you've got to kind of learn what the benefits are to everybody. I personally believe the absolute best financing that you can ever get is some type of seller financing, owner financing. Right now with the market the way it is, and if you have a good W-2 income, go get as many safe 30-year, 40-year loan, 50-year if you can get them, loans that you can get. Go get as many as you can get. But I think the, the seller financing, if it's structured properly, is the best absolutely you can get because there's no limitations. Uh, there's a thousand different ways you can write it to make it good for you and that seller, okay? And it is a mindset. Um, during 2019, during 2019, let me ask you guys, was, was it kind of a seller's market then? The interest rate pretty low still then? It was, wasn't it? Okay. We bought a bunch of stuff that year with sell, by using seller financing. We bought four homes from individuals that was over age 70, 172 and 176. I forget what the others were. We got 30 year, 360 months, no balloon, 3% interest. Now, how do we do that? Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. And there's one, if you're going for that with an older person, there's one question that you can ask, and you'd never in a million years dream of what that question is. But um, we're going to talk about it in a minute. But why would they do that? Why would they do that? And, and that W-O-W in there, that's words of wisdom. Balloons are for clowns, folks. <laughs> All right, some of these lenders might hate me. Don't hate, hate me, Jeff. But balloons are for clowns. And a lot of times they're not good for the buyer or the seller. Because you end up running into a problem there. Okay? Do I have one? I've got one. No, yeah, I've got one balloon out there now. It's coming due next year. But it was for 0% interest for five years. Okay? So I, I kind of roll with the flow there. So you got to, first of all, you know, there's nothing created in this world but what it's not first a thought. Okay? I believe the whole earth was a thought before it was created. And anything we do. And if you don't have the right mindset, you're going to miss so many opportunities. You know, uh, you, you've all heard the thing that if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you're going to treat every problem like a nail. And... All I'm doing, there's so many ways to make money, folks. I mean, you've heard the Airbnb and you heard Al 
Williams from talking about the extended stay. All the, I mean, it's just so many ways to make a ton of money, and this is just one little segment of it. You know, I've got an hour, or as long as Jim will let me take, and as long as you guys will put up with me uh, to talk about this, but, but is it, this is just one little segment of ways to make money, and there's some myths, and I need to be able to read this myself if, so you guys can ever see. I've got a friend in New Orleans, and I think he's bought and sold over a thousand. How many houses has Carl done, Brett? Probably a thousand since Katrina. He cannot get an owner finance deal. You know why? He thinks like an economist. And you know, for every economist, there's an equal and opposite economist. Okay? And economists put everybody in the same category. They, they bunch them all together. And that doesn't work. But he thinks that every homeowner in New Orleans knows what the market is, has the same values, has the same desires, and all those things. And he will tell you, you're not going to find owner financing in, in my market. And, I, and you might feel that way with, with the things like they are right now. And, I, and that's a myth. I'll disagree with you. Every homeowner has the same values. That's a myth. They don't. Every homeowner is, has the same state of mind. Are there people getting divorces? Have you ever heard of tax sales where people walk away from free and clear property because they don't pay their taxes for three years? Why wouldn't they give you owner financing? Why wouldn't they? You know, you know what you have to do? You have to have a right attitude and you have to ask about it. Every homeowner cares and is not willing to walk away. We just said that one. Every homeowner needs cash or wants cash. They will tell you that, and you might think that, and nobody, the way the market is now, everybody wants cash. Not true. Everybody needs cash. Not true. What are they going to do with it? Well, we'll talk about that. Here's one of my sayings. It's irrational to assume that everybody else acts rationally. Okay, you got to develop this attitude, okay? And what you have to understand about real estate, real estate is an imperfect market. If you're buying Coca-Cola and you're in New York or Lubbock, Texas or Tokyo and you buy it at the same second, you're all going to pay the same price. It's kind of like a perfect market in that respect, right? But <clears throat> there's always some imperfections in the real estate market. And what you have to do in times like these especially, you have to look for those imperfections. What's an imperfection? Driving for dollars and you go down the street, there's a house, grass is all grown up, it's vacant, window knocked out, whatever the case might be. There's an imperfection in the market. Um, there's people who are troubled for whatever reason. Like I said, divorces, they've lost their job. I mean, you could just go on with a list after list after list. And I've been, I've been at a point in my life when I was numb for three years, totally numb mentally, because I had one of those people when I was about 29 years old zap me for 400 and something thousand dollars in real estate. Okay, that was my $400,000 seminar. And it took me about three years to get over it. But people get in that state of mind where they're kind of numb. They don't want to list their house with a real estate agent. They don't want a bunch of people tromping through their house. Um, you know, you can just go on and on. So don't assume because you wouldn't do it or the guy down the street or that everybody's in the same category that that person won't do seller financing. <clears throat> Pete Fortunato says, do unto others as they would have you do unto them. Think about that. That's deep. But you know what? Their values are probably different than your values. Okay? So don't impose your values upon those folks. <clears throat> the other attitude that you have to have is that of a buyer, not a borrower. Borrowers are beggars. In any, bankers in here? 
Uh, and I'm not picking on Jeff and these guys, okay? But, you know, I learned a long time ago, back years ago, when I would go get owner financing, instead of going in there and getting down on my knees and begging for a loan at the banker, to the banker when they're sitting there trying to meet a quota, I just go in and sit down and say, look, I'm here to help you meet your quota for the month. And, and that kind of takes away that, you know, uh, attitude that some bankers have when they were loaning you money. But so when you go to go and get seller financing, don't go in there as a beggar. Don't go with that attitude. Remember, they have a problem. And, there's, and, and Warren Harding, anybody in here ever heard of Warren Harding? Not the president. Okay. Warren Harding was Jack Miller and John Schaub and Peter Fortunato's mentor, okay? The ones you've heard these guys talk about? Well, um, he said that there's never a bad piece of real estate, only bad circumstances around which it's, it's owned, okay? So you have to keep that in mind and find out what those bad circumstances are, and you're there to solve a problem and you're in control. You can say yes or no. And the other thing you have to understand, there's no money going to change hands unless you give them a little down payment. Um, they have the house, and, it, and they're going to do an installment sale. All right? So start thinking installment sale. <clears throat> now, another thing is you might think, well, there's no houses out there to... Um, be available that's free and clear. About 40% of all homes in America right now are free and clear, more than you would think. And in some of the poorer states like uh, West Virginia, Mississippi, my home state, Louisiana, <clears throat> they even have higher amounts of homes that are free and clear. In the poor states, you go down to Panama, Central America, pretty poor, 95% of all the homes in Panama, Central America is free and clear. And they try to pay them off really fast. Um, Y'all read that wow, right? I'm not going to read it to you. Okay. Um, now, how do you spot opportunities? You know when you, you buy a new car and you go pick that car out you haven't seen any like it on the road until you get on the road with yours and you say, my gosh, look at that. There's, there's one like that, just the same color as mine. Golly, I didn't know there were so many people had that. So you start seeing it, and opportunities are like that. You know, we drive right by thousands of opportunities every day, and we don't see them. And so you kind of have to train yourself and... This is one of the things, or there are several of the things to look for. And <clears throat> the more of those that you can check off, the better chance you're going to get owner financing. Um, retiring investors, sick and tired of management. Um, I, I hope I have enough time to get through this, but let me tell you a quick story. About three or four years ago, um, Adam, my son, he does most of the marketing, and a lot of you in this room know Adam. And uh, he said, Dad, I got a, a guy you need to go see. Sit down at his kitchen table and talk to him about he's a good candidate for seller financing. So I go, and the guy lives in a very nice home, and he's retired, and he had bought a house like four years before and rented it to the military, and he paid cash for this house. And the reason he did that is he had a bunch of money, I didn't know this till later, sitting in his checking account, and he bought that house so he could get a, a, a much better rate of return on the house. And so we made him an offer. And I, I, the house was in very, very nice condition, almost didn't have to do anything to it, in a great neighborhood, and offered him $140,000. 3% interest, 360 payments, and we had a nice conversation, and uh, I thought he was going to do it, and he said, well, let, let me just rent it again for a little bit and see how we do. So he did that. Rented it to two professional tenants. 
He didn't know anything that Jeffrey Taylor talked about today. And he was a great guy, great family. They did everything in the book to him that you could do just about wrong. They didn't tear the house up real bad. They never cleaned it. They talked him into leaving the utilities in his name. And then they weren't making payments. Then he told them he'd give them two months to get out. And his attorney told him, well, since you've told them two months, you've got to give that to them. I mean, he did everything wrong. And finally, uh, I'm sitting back at his kitchen table and offered him exactly the same thing. I had this 10B2 calculator that you have on your phone, and I texted it to him, and, and boom, he pulled up what I'd or emailed to him before, and it was exactly the same offer. He said, we're going to do that. So we bought that house, 140000 360 payments, and 3% interest, no balloon, and the guy was 72 years old. Now, he wanted to trust me, and he wanted to come to my house to write the contract. I said, come on over. So when they were at my house, he, his wife and my wife were in the kitchen, and she told my wife, you guys are the answer to a prayer. We are so thankful for you. And you know how much I put down on that house? Zero. You know why? It was never mentioned. I never brought it up. He never brought it up. So after about four months of making payments on that house, he called me up one day and he said, Leon, he said, um, <clears throat> I don't know if it'll help you any or not, but he said, I've got another $400,000 sitting in my checking account. If you guys can use it to do some real estate deals, I'd be happy to work with you on it. And we went, and we went a year without using any of that money, and now I think Adam and, and Brett back there has used it a three or four or five times. Sure. Got a flip going with it right now, okay? So that's just one example of a tired landlord. <clears throat> but out-of-town owners, big candidates for it. Anybody in here ever, ever owned a house out of town? Was it, look, I have too. We used to own a lot of houses in the Kansas City area, moved to Mississippi. And I'll tell you, some of those houses uh, got to be a liability instead of an asset just because of that distance thing, okay? Now, I suppose I could have hired somebody to manage them or whatever, but Jack Miller always told me a property manager will uh, charge you 10% and lose tw another 20% for you. So, you know, I was kind of stuck on that. That was one of my biases. But people that have owned it for a long time, and believe it or not, older owners, uh, it's been vacant for a long time, owes back taxes, free and clear, owns other property somewhere, you know, maybe they're making two payments or whatever, or, or whatever the case might be, uh, have a non-paying tenant, and they hate that management, needs rehab, no dollars, no ability, no desire to do it. I want to tell you a quick story about that. And, and I remember times on some of my out-of-town properties, every time that address was mentioned, I'd get ill, you know, and there's people like that. Um, a vacant house. So a vacant house, does it have cash flow? Huh? Oh yeah, it's got cash flow. It's negative. Negative cash flow. You still have you still have insurance and most of these homeowners still have their homeowners insurance and the thing's been vacant six or eight months and they don't know they're paying for insurance that won't pay off if something happens. You know, they didn't they didn't buy vacant house insurance. Um, they're, they're worried at night about uh, uh, vandalism. They're still having to keep utilities on, pay taxes on it, keep the maintenance and yard mode and all those things. So there's a lot of negative cash flow, right? Did I say something about referring to freedom and peace? Could you help those folks get freedom and peace in their life by solving that problem? You can increase their, I had a house one time, and I, I don't like to make offers over the phone, especially owner finance, but this lady was in California, and I knew I'd never sit down at her table, and so I offered her X amount. Oh, no, we, we can't do that. And I, and I started asking her, how much are your taxes? How much are your insurance? How much is this? How much is that? 
And I said, let's add that to the payment that I'm going to do you. And that's what cash flow I'm increasing for you. It's not just that payment I'm giving you. It's that lack of expenses that you're not going to have anymore. Your cash flow is going. She said, you know, I like that. I think I'll do that. Well, the Dern house had Chinese firewall or drywall in it, so I didn't buy it. But um, I want to tell you a couple more stories about these, these things right here. Um, a few years ago, and this was a younger lady, um, she was a realtor, lived about six or seven hours away in another state. It was another deal that Adam found for me, and he had mailed her a letter because she was behind in her taxes, and it was a vacant house. Those two things. She told me she kept that letter six months before she opened it. She had it by her refrigerator or something. She finally opened it, called Adam. Adam said, hey, Dad, you need to go on this one. So I go, she drives over from Louisiana, meet her at the house. I walk through the house. It, was gonna, it had been vacant for a couple of years. She was two years behind in the taxes. Um, looking at this needs rehab, she didn't have the money to do it. Needed a new roof, probably going to need a new air. Yes, it did. Um, and she didn't have the ability to get it fixed up to list with a realtor and had no desire to do that. And some uh, wholesaler had offered her $50,000 to buy it, and that offended her. And the wholesaler had looked on the county records, and they had the square footage as 1,200 when it was like 2,200. Okay? So I asked her what she wanted. We had a nice conversation, built rapport, and she said she wanted 107,000. I really didn't want to pay quite that much because I knew it was going to take about 20 grand to fix it up. And I said, well, let me just ask you this. If, if in the event that I could pay you $100,000 for it, give you $5,000 down, now you're going to have to pay those taxes back, and it was like $4,300 in taxes that she owed, okay? Um, and, and we'll... I'll give you um, 360 payments at 3% interest. She thought for a little bit. She said, let's go over to my sister's house and write up the deal. She was a realtor. Two years behind in her taxes, so it was six months from losing the house. So we did that, and um, right before closing, man, I was pumped up about this deal, okay? So right before closing, a couple days before, and I knew she was only going to go home with about $700, and we had a closing date. I called her up, and I, I said, Robin, I uh, wanted to let you know the closing date so-and-so, and I'm praying she's not going to say, you know, uh, I, I've decided not to do it or whatever the case might be. And uh, I said, look, you're only going to go home with $700. And I said, would it be helpful to you if I went ahead and paid you a year's payments in advance in exchange for a 15% discount. And she said, on the whole house? I said, no, no, just add up one year's payments, not 15% off of that, and I'll pay you in advance. And she said, oh, Mr. Leon, I wish I had two houses to sell you. <laughs> so that house, because of all those situations right there, young lady, I'm paying her that money. So the day of closing, we did the closing, and I had a loan modification agreement ready, and I brought a check for that year's payments with a 15% discount. When the closing was done, I slid that modification agreement across to her. She read it, agreed to it. I gave her a check, and she had signed it, and the attorney uh, witnessed it. And boom, I had no payments the first year. Second year rolls around, she said, nah, I think I want the money every month. Well, this February, just passed, she called me up and she said, is there a chance we could do that year in advance thing again? So, so we did it again. And that house rents for $1,300 a month. Okay? And my payment's $400.52 or something like that. So that's how you find the opportunities. You know, you, you look for those and you look for ways that you can give pe people freedom and peace for not having those burdens on them right there. Okay? Now, dirty words. Never, ever, never utter the words seller finance, owner finance, 
or creative finance to a civilian when you're buying. Okay? Now, if you're selling, those are golden words, right? But don't ever, ever, ever say that. It's kind of, and I'm being real nice when I say it's like cold calling and asking somebody to marry you. Okay? Um, you know what the answer is going to be, right? It's going to be no, 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 no. Because there's something that has to happen for you to get seller financing. And I don't know how people do it virtually. I'm not that good. I don't know how to do it. I have to do it one-on-one. -on -one. I like to look them in the eye, sit down, because, and I've been guilty years ago, 40 years ago, I'd sit down and write 40 offers and give them to a realtor and say, go present those. You know how many got accepted? About zero, okay? Just about zero. I wasted my time and I wasted that realtor's time. So that seller has to be sold on you as an individual. They have to know that um, you're a reputable person. They, know, they have to know that you're competent. Um, they have to know that you're trustworthy. And, and I don't know, uh, I don't care how good of a realtor you are, it's going to be hard for you to go present an offer to your, if you're even for the listing agent, and get somebody to accept uh, an owner finance deal because that seller needs to like you. They want to look you in the eye. They want to feel good about you. And, and what if you give that offer to uh, 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 a, the, a friend of yours that's a realtor and then she takes it over to the listing agent and it goes through that process, what chance do you think you have of getting a, uh, an owner finance deal taken? Almost none, right? Because so, you can't build rapport and they can't, they have to sell you and, it, and they're not in the business of selling you. They're in the business of selling what? S sticks, bricks, and dirt. Okay? Uh, and if I do make an offer with a realtor, I will not do it unless uh, the realtor allows me to go with them to present that offer. Otherwise, I consider that I'm wasting my time. The next thing about it, it's not about them, it's about the house. And this is some of the things that you're going to do, and you'll be surprised what some of these simple questions will do for you to get you uh, an owner finance deal. You're going you're gonna to have to go look at the house, of course, and go kick the bricks and whatnot, but try to find out some things about them. See if what you have in common. I'm okay, you're okay. You've got to establish that. And... and uh, one of the best ways to establish credibility with someone is ask them questions about them. And what I usually do is I will ask you, where are you from originally? Have I asked anybody that in the room since I've been here? Raise your hand if I've asked you that. If I've gotten close to you, I've probably asked you, yeah. Um, you know, where are you from originally? Where'd you go to high school? Where'd you go to college? What kind of work did you do? And try to, it's crazy how you'll find people that you know and, you know, people from their area. It was crazy. I met this couple. Jim introduced us the other night. And um, come to find out that uh, uh, in our conversation that lasted an hour or two, these things kept popping up. And, and his mother lives like 20 miles east uh, west of me on the same highway, and, and this is country folks, okay? Um, and then we talk a little bit longer, and I said something about, well, dang, I got this little place I ought to Airbnb on the water, and I told them it was on the Pascagoula River, and they said, where? And I said, potty call, and they go, really? We, where's your place down there? Her parents have a place half a block right there. I've met her parents before, okay? We stopped and talked. <laughs> So we talk a little bit longer, and he tells me his mom teaches uh, in Hattiesburg. And I said, where does she teach? In uh, Presbyterian Christian School. Oh, really? What does she teach? Well, she's my grandson's English teacher. <laughs> so, you know, when you do that, I hope I started building credibility with you guys. <laughs> and then they, they said, man, we love that area down there. And he said, 
look, I'll go ahead and, and uh, I want to rent your place over uh, uh, Easter. And he said, I'll pay for it. So I got my trip up here paid for already. <laughs> okay? So, you, you know, you just talk to people. And um, let me tell you this. You do this to people everywhere you go. Are, are, is, are there anybody here that's just scared to death to talk to people? Do you have a hard time? Are, are you an uh, introvert? You know, is, is it difficult? Pardon? Yeah, yeah. So what you do is you practice this, whether you're at somebody's uh, kitchen table about, uh, you know, to buy, wanting to buy their property and get owner financing, you practice it at restaurants. You practice it everywhere you go. It, heck, if I get a chance to talk to somebody at the gas station and they're pumping gas on the other side, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to know stuff about them. How many people here know the, the name of the chef for the restaurant in there and how many kids he has and where he's from? Bunny that works in there, where's she from? Where's her husband from? I can tell you all of that. So you just, you just ask people. You just talk to them and, and get to know them, and people like that. Now, how do we get 70-plus-year-old people to finance for 30 years with no balloon? Because the first thing they're going to say is, I don't buy green bananas, folks. So why would I want to do that? And I might ask them, I might say, well, what, do you have any CDs or stocks or bonds or anything like that? Um, what's going to happen to that when you go to heaven? And uh, they said, well, my kids are going to get it. And I tell them, well, your kids are gonna, we're going to keep paying your kids. And I'm at the age now, I tell them, look, my kids might be paying your kids. <laughs> and, 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 and you're going to have to, again, establish your competency because um, they want to know that you're competent. So if you've had 45 years of experience in managing real estate, then, then that kind of makes you competent. You know, you're still at it. You haven't given up yet. So one of the most important questions that you can ask those folks is do you have kids? And most everybody likes to talk about their kids. And so, and, and you know, that gets put in the conversation, right? You know, it's like these people that do the surveys. They don't ask you what they really want to know. They sneak it in somewhere. Okay, well, we're going to sneak that in. You have kids? And, we, and you've got to genuinely care, okay? That's why you ask. You, first of all, you've got to really care about people to do this. And so you ask them about their kids. Oh, really? Where do they live? What kind of work do they do? Uh, and you want to see what kind of uh, financial status they have. You want to know if they're meth heads. You want to know all kinds of things about them. You want to know if they're interested in that property that maybe they're going to sell you. And when they, whenever they bring it up about, well, I don't buy green bananas, then, you know, it's kind of like people have this notion that the day before they die they're going to sell everything they've got and put their cash on the table and leave it for their kids you know so that's not going to happen so you have to ask those kind of things about their kids and uh, if you practice asking this to everybody it gets real easy sitting at that kitchen table or out on the back patio because the house stinks so bad that you can't go back through it you know so <laughs> uh You've been there, right? Uh, I've had some that walk through the house and come out the master bedroom onto the deck off the master bedroom, and I say, ain't no way I'm walking back through that house. I'm going around the house when we leave. So we take care of business out there, you know. So it's not about the house. It's about them. I had one guy, as a matter of fact, I think I told you guys that story. The guy we bought the, the place on the river from, He'd had it for sale for two or three years. And uh, he has since passed away, by the way. We're still paying his wife. But we got 240 payments, 3% interest, no balloon. And this guy, he, I know he was in his 60s or whatever. He'd smoked a lot of dope, but uh, <laughs> I do know that. And he was pretty eccentric, but he was pretty eccentric. They owned a pretty uh, uh, 
successful business and, and a nice place where Rachel grew up there. But um, I started asking him all these questions after we'd looked at the house. And you know what he did? He looked at me. He said, you're asking all the right questions. And I wasn't even asking him about the house. I was asking him about family. You know, so it does make a big difference because they feel like you care if you care enough to ask. Which, first thing on the next slide there. So that helps you build credibility and trust and, and uh, spend a lot of time with them talking about you know, their family and, and start asking them what it is they really want and you want to find out what their sense of urgency is. By the way, if at the end of this, I've got my email up there. If you guys will email me, I'll email you all these slides. I don't have anything to sell. Um, you can't buy anything from me. I, I'm not selling any of my houses. So uh, you, you can't buy anything from me. So you can have these slides. But, um, and I don't even have them copyrighted. You know, I mean, if it helps you, I hope it does. I really hope it does help you. I hope you guys get something out of this. Um, but you ask questions that's going to help you determine, you know, what their sense of urgency is. And how many people in here know Clyde Wilson? Y'all know Clyde? If you don't know him, you're missing out. Clyde is a character. But uh, he's, he's been a good mentor for me through the years. And one of the things he taught me to find out what people are going to do with the money is you ask them, they tell you their price, and you don't argue with them. And you tell them or ask them, look, if I showed up here tomorrow with a paper bag full of cash and it's got name their price in it, we put it out on the table and you count it and it's all there, what are you going to do with it? And you can, that question will do two things for you. One, it'll tell you, their sense of urgency. If they tell you it's none of your business, you know right away they, they don't have a sense of urgency, right? So, um, and if I see them hesitate, I let them off the hook by saying, uh, look, I've got a reason for asking you. In case you um, uh, have a, uh, some silver bullet place that you're going to put this money, a great investment, I might want to put some in there with you. Okay, kind of let them off the hook a little bit. You don't want to put them on, you know, on a bad spot or anything like that. But a lot of times, they'll just up and tell you. And several years ago, about six years ago, a friend of mine who is a blue-collar guy, he's a welder and plumber and that sort of thing, but a great neighbor and a great friend, um, he had cut himself with a chainsaw in November, just got over that. He's putting up my uh, gate or helping with my gate, and he cut his finger really, really bad. So I took him to the hospital and didn't think his wife was going to get to go. She hops in the back of the truck. We go to the hospital, and on, you know, and on the way home, he's like this up in the front seat, and she's in the back seat. And I, started, I said, look, Eddie, we've got to get you away from power tools. And... Um, and so I started telling them how to find an opportunity, you know, different things like that. And the wife in the back, Patty says, well, I know somebody that needs to sell their house. Eddie said, well, call them right now. And to make a long story short, the next day at 3.30, we were over at the house and, sh and looking at it. And that's one that we went through the house. And Eddie said, I wouldn't close my eyes in that house. Uh, I mean, there was dogs. I mean, you couldn't look at the ceiling to see if it was leaking for tripping over about four or five dogs. And that house was a mess. I don't think it had been vacuumed since 1976. And, and um, the yard was all grown up with weeds. You couldn't even see the house or whatever. So we get out on the back, and I ask her that question. You know, what would you do with the cash? And she said, well, I'd get me a mobile home out in the country and get me some new furniture. Oh, by the way, there was pieces of cotton and stuffing out of chairs and everything all over the house that those dogs had just torn out and she didn't bother to pick up, okay? And I'm not gonna tell you what was in one of the bedrooms. It was the doggy bathroom. But uh, anyway, it was really bad. So she told us what she wanted. She wanted $60,000. And I'm thinking, man, do I race to the truck and get a check? 
right now because this is going to be a deal. Four bedroom, two bath house, an extremely nice area. And so I said, look, Suzanne, don't do anything. Let us see if we can help you get what you're looking for. So Eddie and I, for two weeks, man, we was hunting everywhere for, for uh, something that fit what she wanted. Couldn't find anything. Finally, uh, we, um, uh, we get a call from his, his wife, and, and she said, look, she's got a place to put a mobile home if you could find a single wide. So we started looking, found a single wide. Guy wanted 20000 Wouldn't negotiate a penny. I said, well, look, I'm going to have a lady come look at this thing. And if you mention price, the deal's off. So got her out there. She loved it. Had my guest house had extra furniture stacked in it from another house. We bought brand new furniture. Said, come over and look at our furniture. Comes over. No, she didn't like it. So I said, what am I going to do? And so I said, look, I don't know if it'll work for you or not, but what, what if we bought that mobile home for you, had it moved, and I listed off a whole bunch of things. We hook up the sewer, hook up the water, skirt it, get cold air blowing for you, build a deck, all of that, and give you 5000 for furniture. And she said, oh, yeah, I'd do that. Well, guess what? The next morning, she went and got a $500 tattoo on her foot with that $5,000. That was the <laughs> first thing. But when, when the smoke cleared, we had her so happy and we got it for $32,000 for the whole deal. And we put 48 in the house, and it's worth close to 200 now. And it's been rented this summer to the same person, uh, 1275 a month for six years. Okay? So, yeah, I must have pushed that button. Uh, one of Pete Fortunato's favorite questions, and I like to give credit to some of my mentors where I get this, and those of you who know him have heard this a thousand times. I like to ask people, why would you sell a nice home like this? I just couldn't bring myself to ask that question to that lady. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's, uh, she would have known that I was being uh, facetious or something, but... But, you know, that doesn't put people on the defensive. You're not, you're not bad-mouthing their house. You're not challenging them. And you want them to like you, you know. You're not going to go in there and just start beating them up on their house and expect to get seller financing. Uh, I know I, this is the second time I had that slide up there. I, I'm slipping a little bit, but I knew I put that in there twice. Don't ever utter the words... Owner finance, creative finance, or seller finance when you're buying. That is so important because the answer is always going to be no. It's an installment sale. And it must be legitimate because that, that is an IRS term. How many people know what IRS Publication 537 is? Okay, few people. If you don't know what IRS Publication 537 is, when, as soon as you get to a printer where you can print, go in there and print that off, staple it, keep it with you, and read that whole thing two or three times. Highlight it. And when you're dealing with folks who own um, investment property, you're going to need that right there because there's so many things that that right there will do to help you... Uh, get them to sell or finance for you. Most of them think they want the cash, but when they realize they're going to have to recapture capital gains, I mean, oh, excuse me, recapture depreciation, and they pay taxes on that like ordinary income tax, and they've told you they're going to go put the money in the bank, and I ask them what kind of rate of return are they going to get on that? Have you checked that out? What, what would you get on something, an account you could put in the bank where you could put out, pull out so much every month right now? And I, I don't know if you can get that much even on a million dollars, can you? Let's say you could. Let's say you could get 1%. And you're offering them 3%. Three times as much. But... I, I, I contend there's a lot of destitute millionaires. They've worked really hard all their life. They've saved money. They're like my friend that sold us the house, nothing down. They got the money sitting there getting no return on it. But let's say they're getting 1%. Let's 
1% of a million dollars, and let's forget taxes, is $10,000 in a year. That's $833 a month. They can't come rent a mobile home from me. And they're cash millionaires without digging into their principal. So if they sell a house or, or, or a piece of property, commercial property, mobile home park, whatever it is, and before they can get to the bank with the money, they're going to have to pay capital gains. They're going to get, have to uh, pay taxes on the recapture of the depreciation. And they've got a big chunk of money coming out of their pocket before they ever make it to the bank where they're going to get less than 1%. Okay? So if you do an installment sale, oh, I've got to hustle. If you do an installment sale, then um, they're, going to draw, they're not going to have to pay taxes on that right away. And you're going to be paying them interest on that money until they collect it from you. So it's a better deal for them. Okay? So you, you got to know, like I said in the beginning, you know, what's good for that seller. And, and the one way you can do it. Who, know, who does not know what Section 121 of the IRS code is? Do, you don't know? Oh, my. If you're buying from a homeowner, did you know that... Um, Married filing jointly, you can sell a house that you've lived in two out of the last five years and get up to a $500,000 profit tax-free. Tax-free. If you didn't know it and you're in the real estate business, and I'm not putting down on you, that's why I put it in here, okay? Uh, do you think homeowners know about Section 121? They don't. If they're single, they can make $250,000. I'll try to get through this. Now that they've said yes, because I'm just now getting to the most important part. Um, now what? You've got to memorialize the agreement. And what do you want? I know what I want, and I want some kind of a good long-term investment. You can take two houses side by side, same builder, same uh, good construction, same school district, same everything in one of those houses, can be a fantastic in the investment and the other one can be a super poor investment. What's the difference? Financing. That one with a good financing is going to be a great. So I want a long, good long-term hold asset and I, and I want to get it so, with a payment that the tenants can afford. Don't ever buy anything your tenants can't afford. And so I want discounted terms. There's two ways to look at discounted terms. First of all, you want a buyer-favored note and uh, a deed of trust or a mortgage if you're in a mortgage state. I know Virginia is a deed of trust state and so is Mississippi. So you want to get those kind of terms. And the other thing you want is good time value of, of money discounted terms. And when I say um, a discounted note or safe terms, you want to know this. I don't want a do on sale clause in there. I have that in my contract. No do on sale clause. I want it taken out. Um, I want that property to be the sole security for the debt. Uh, if you don't know what a non-recourse note is, you might want to do that. Because if you, if you have, sign a note with no collateral, everything you've got is collateral. Does that make sense? So. If you want that house, if you end up losing it or whatever, you want to, uh, if they get a deficiency judgment, then you don't want them going after other stuff that you have. You want to write a first refusal to purchase the note back. And why would you want that? Um, it goes in mind that they have to give me a 90-day notice to say yes or no to buy it. They have to get three brokers to give them a bid. And that's never going to happen. And another 90 days to come up with the money. And if you're a note broker, any note brokers in here, and if you came across that, that, that's a poison pill, would you give them a bid? It almost makes that note worthless. Um, I want the right to substitute collateral or walk the mortgage. No prepayment penalty. I want a 30-day written notice of default. If some reason, say I mail a payment and it doesn't get there, after 30 days, a lot of deeds of trust and notes say that, that they can call the whole thing due. I put, uh, I put a deal in there that says 
they have to uh, send me a certified letter telling me that they didn't get it and give me a chance to pay them, okay? Um, and the big thing is people all the time are trying to figure out is this a good deal or not. If it's structured where good market rent covers the principal interest taxes and insurance maintenance, gives you some reserves for, um, uh, for maintenance, and uh, gives you a good cash flow, it's a deal. You don't have to think very hard about that. A big warning, do not leave the terms of your loan installment purchase up to your closing attorney. I don't care if you've been with him 20 years. You better read that daggum note and deed of trust. I do it every time. And I find, I find do on sale clauses still in there. I find that they didn't put the right of first refusal for the note in there. Find all those kind of things. Another big thing is, I'm, I'm going to hurry here because I'm getting to the, I hadn't even told my good story yet. <laughs> um, understand, now, now we're talking about time value of money. Understanding your net present value, that's where that financial calculator, versus the face amount or the current value of the note. Jimmy Napier's book here, and if you don't have this, you should order this book. Don't do it from Amazon. Get it from GaryJohnston.com. He'll get it for 20 bucks. On Amazon, it might be 50, 60, 80 bucks, okay? Um, but in this book, he said only the IRS and the uninformed think that the value of a note is, is what's written on the face amount um, or what the current balance is. And that's a big secret that uh, is not taught in public schools. Uh, Invest in Debt by Jimmy Napier. Anybody know what arbitrage is? Okay. Um, okay, I don't tell you. Google it. I, but <laughs> basic, basically, I got to hurry. Basically, arbitrage is when something is worth something in one amount in a, this market, and over here it's in a different market. Anybody buy a bottle of water at the airport coming here? How much was it? Four bucks. Okay. How much did you get it at your local grocery store? At 25, 30 cents, okay? Um, and, and I wanted to talk about inflation too, but you know that dollar will buy different amounts in different markets. And that same thing is true with a note. And let's say you give somebody a $100,000 $100, note, and, and that note that you put in your, your um, word processor and print out on a blank piece of paper is legal to do that. Do you know you could trade that for a house? But you can't print out those dollar bills, you get in big trouble for that, okay? So if it's written on there, it's 100000 then uh, how do we know what the real present value is and, and if, if they ever had to go sell that note? Um, first of all, you calculate the payment, and on that 100000 3%, it's $421.60 is what the payment is. But what would that note be worth if, if it was sold out on the open market and the going rate is uh, that investor wants a 12% return? He said it. 40987 bucks. Now, on page 31 in this book, bottom right-hand side of the page, Jimmy Napier says that if... Um, you are selling a piece of property and you accept a $100,000 note, you take it and put it in your safe, you haven't sold it yet at a discount, which is the only place you can go get rid of it now. He says that discount don't take place when you sell it, it took place the day you accepted it. So let's flip that. We're a buyer now. We put that piece of paper in there and we print that note up and we give it to that seller, and it says 100000 on it, but in reality, out in the market, it's only worth $40,900 at a 12%. And uh, what would you rather do? Go give them 60000 cash or a $100,000 note that's worth $41,000? That's the value of discounted terms. Okay, and that note written the way it's written with all those things in there, hey, you're the only one that's going to want to buy it back. Negotiating, 
You know, if the seller names a price, um, if they name the price, I'm going to name the terms, okay? If they, if they name the terms and cash is terms, one of the terms, I'm going to name the price. I want to get one or the other. If I don't get one or the other, I'm not going to be doing it. Um, now, beyond the owner finance deal, this is a big deal. I, I know that uh, Jeff covered it like the 10, 10 for 12 earlier, but I stay in touch with all my people. I do some crazy things. When I can, guess what I do every month? And I know with all the automation we have today, and man, you're slick, you're going to do it, but I have to go to town once a month. So I go by the bank, and I deposit the money right in their account. And um, then I text them, say, hey, just made your payment. Merry Christmas. Just made your payment. Happy Easter. And I keep in touch with them every month. I let them know that I'm there. I care about them. Uh, I, this one lady is 76 years old when we bought her house, 30 years, 3%. I called her every month. And, and she lives alone, and I think she looks forward to just talking to me every month. You know, we have a conversation about whatever. And, hey, I'm back in the vehicle driving down the street, and I call them. And there's certain ones of them. The guy that offers us extra $400,000, we are not going to ask for a second bite out of the apple with him. But there's a lot of them that it helps them. The other thing is, uh, who was it today that talked about time being important? Was that Jeff? David? Look, I didn't put this slide in there. You've got to give your efforts time to compound. When you put these things in place, don't get in a hurry to go sell them, go mess with them. You know, you learn how to manage, and you get those things managed. But let me tell you about this one deal, and I'll be done, okay? Um... This was a house, again, my son Adam found it. The lady was two years behind in her taxes, almost three, about to lose it. And, um, we, and, and she had been an attorney in three states. No dummy, okay? So we go in that house, and she had let the leaves pile up in a, in a, a valley in the back, and a tree had started growing in it and run a root back up under, caused it to leak in the house, the, the, uh, the, uh, dry, the ceiling was falling in. Very nice wood floor about that thick was just peeled up, okay? And so you get the point. And um, we knew how, about how much it was going to take to get this house fixed up and everything. And Adam offered her 60000 She would not take it, would not take it. He worked on her for several days. And finally, she said, I'm not taking a penny less than $100,000. Finally, he said, okay, I'll give you $100,000, but here's how we're going to do it. We're going to give you $10,000 down and $500 a month for 180 payments. Do you all see any interest in that? All right, so no interest. She said, okay, I'll do that. So she moved off out west somewhere or another and was going to build one of those grass houses with the mud on it and that sort of thing and uh, with her $10,000. And... and I keep up with people on Facebook, too, when I can after these deals. And one day, she posted on Facebook, I need help. That's all she put. I need help. Okay? So she, um, I said, something's going on. So I went in her bank to make the deposit. She still had a local bank account. And when I went in, I always tell the teller, would you check my account number to make sure I'm right? And when she checked the account number, I could see this look on her face. And I knew immediately she was overdrawn. So what I did was, is I, uh, I said, oh, we're a little overdrawn. Yeah, but this $500 payment will bring you up just a little bit. So stuck that in my brain. And so a few days later, I hear from her, and she is back living with her friends back in Mississippi. And so I, uh, the second bite out of the apple, I called her up and I said, Wanda, I, I, I don't know if it'll help you or not, but right now I've got a little extra money. I'll give you uh, $5,000 for, 
for a year of payments in advance. Oh my gosh, that'll help me so much. My trucks broke down, da 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 da. So I really helped her, okay? So I gave her $5,000, a 10 for 12 deal. And while we were there, she said, you don't have a mobile home or anything out in the country that, um, you know, that I could rent or buy from you or whatever, do you? And I'm thinking, you know, she don't have any money. How's she going to buy this thing from me? And I said, well, I just happened to have one move, this young kid that had been trying to sell me this old mobile home. And by the way, her house was nasty when we bought it. This trailer was nasty. So I knew it would be a good fit. <laughs> uh, so... Anyway, I had, to, I had to get steps built, and um, I got steps built for her to see it. It took a week or two, you know, to get her out there. I got it. She walks back and forth through this trailer, and um, she said, I'll do it. And I said, well, Wanda, how are you going to pay me? Well, I'm not sure. And I said, well, what about income? Do you have income? And uh, she said, well, I get $2,200 a month for some retirement thing or something or other. And I'd gotten this little three acres of land, and I'd put two septic tanks on it, and I'd already rented one of the lots for 200 a month. And uh, I said, well, Wanda, um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you the, the title to this mobile home for the next 36 payments starting a year from now. Oh, that'll be great. And I said, you're going to have to pay me 200 a month. So I'm thinking... And she said, well, I'm scared you're going to sell this land out. And I said, Wanda, I don't want to sell this land. I want to, uh, I want to, I want to keep the land. And so we're driving away, and my wife says, why don't you trade her the land for the balance of that note? So anyway, we, we traded her, we traded her the, the, the um, mobile home for the next 36 payments. Now, here's the situation. Okay, this is important to get. That house she lived in, she had inherited it from her mom. She made us take chandeliers down that was real important to her. She was not, was not going to let us rent that house with those chandeliers in it. She didn't care what we did with them. They had to come out, okay? That's how some people think, their values, okay? It's all subjective. So, and she was going to get $100,000 for that house, all right? There was an emotional attachment to that house. Once the house is out of the picture, what do you have? It's not a $90,000 note. It's an income stream of $500 a month. Y'all ever heard of J.G. Wentworth? I want my money and I want it now. Okay. Well, uh, that's the way a lot of this deal is. But here she is. Now she's in a situation where it's going to be like, 47 months before she starts getting $500 a month from me. Meanwhile, she's got to pay me $200 a month. And I said, Wanda, what if I gave you the land and that way immediately you wouldn't have to pay the $200 a month and you could get the $200 a month rent off the other place. So now immediately you've got $400 a month and with owning the land, that's, that can last forever. And if I keep pay, start paying you $500 a month, that's going to run out down the road, okay? So had I been in her position, I'd have probably done what she did. I, I would have probably have done that. And I said, Wanda, you know I really don't want to get rid of this land, so is there any reason you couldn't be, give me a right of first refusal to buy it back should you ever want to sell it? Okay? So I ended up, I ended up, it was 59000 on the note. I had about 10000 in this little mobile home and traded it out. And then we got, ended up with a free and clear house. And I hated that house ever since. <laughs> so the other day, we 10 one in another house that we liked. So, I mean, that's how it goes. And I wish I had time. I'd tell you about the, the, the land that we traded her. That was kind of a crazy deal, too, because we almost had nothing in it. But... The point is, is that you've got to, to care enough about people. And uh, you've got to care enough to ask. Don't be afraid to ask. And people feel good about you when you care about, enough to ask. Um, I hope this helped you. It's, it's afternoon. I know you're tired. And uh, it's been a long two days. But hopefully you all got something out of that.
And if y'all want my slides, you can email me and I'll send them to you. All right. Can you write your email over here?